Folks, let's get started today. Good to see you all. Thursday at 7. All right. First news. The first homework assignment's released. Yay! Woo. You can be a little bit more excited than that. Uh, so the first assignment is released. Uh, the first part should be incredibly easy. Hopefully all of you have already done this. Signed up for the mailing list. Yay, it's super easy. Uh, oh, which you can't see. You can't see anything with what I'm doing. I see. <laughs> Buttons. How do we press them? OK. Cool. So it's up on the website. Everyone can see this now? Cool. OK. Um, so part one, incredibly easy. Sign up for the mailing list. I shouldn't have to elaborate any more on that. Uh, so there's four parts to this homework assignment. The first one is very simple. We'll sign up for the mailing list. You have five points. The next two, so I want to ask a question from the people in the audience. So I know some of you have uh, professional work experience. Some of you may be doing this part time and working at a company. So does anybody who's working at a company in a software computer science field, um, how much of your day or time do you spend coding or fixing bugs? Do you have a rough estimate? Yeah, in the back. You want to tell us where you work first? Or uh, worked? I work here on campus. Mm -hmm. Just Peter. Cool. Like, whole time. But... Whole time? Do you have any meetings? What about, um, so you have meet, what kind of meetings do you have? So you have meetings, um, you have meetings with your boss, meetings with your coworkers. Meeting with our software development team and then meeting with the whole company in general. Mm. What about uh, emails? So uh, do you write any emails? Try not to. <laughs> <laughs> you try not to, okay, 18, 18 two. What about anybody else?
especially as you get more and more senior and take on more and more responsibility, right? A junior developer's job is should be coding as much of the time as possible while the team lead and the management kind of handles all the coordination, but there's uh, oftentimes, especially we got into at Microsoft in a crisis mode one time where we had to work with the office team and they had bugs in their code, so we were writing long emails back and forth and I had to do that. And so that's when I kind of realized you know, your technical ability is incredibly important and your ability to write code, solve problems, design everything you're learning in your CS degree. But a key aspect is your ability to write and communicate. And so if you can't do that effectively, you're not going to be an effective team member, even if you're super effective uh, technically. Uh, if you can't try to communicate or influence your team or try to uh, maybe push back on a bug to say, hey, this isn't really a bug, or maybe to say that, no, we really need to fix this bug before we push because it's going to have severe consequences. All of this comes back into writing. Um, and so why I bring that up is part of these writing assignments, uh, part of this assignment is actually writing things with words into coherent sentences and coherent paragraphs with a logical flow and structure. Um, and I do, I, I mean, I, this isn't just me making you do busy work. I do think this type of stuff is incredibly important. So not only is it going to learn and, as we'll see, kind of reinforce the concepts we've been talking about in here, but you're actually practicing skills that you don't often get to practice in a computer science course. So, uh, so yeah, so the second part is basically you're a CSIO of a startup, you're in charge of writing their security policies, but more than that, you're in charge of securing the organization. So you, I want a description of what are the threats that the organization, that you think the organization will face, what are the likelihoods that you feel um, about those threats, what's the policy that you want to put in place in order to combat those threats, and what mechanisms are you going to put in place to enforce that policy, and why, and why those mechanisms, why do you think that those will effectively implement your policy. Um, and the key here is that you need to argue for the effectiveness of your policy, not just from a technical perspective, but also from a business perspective. So this is where maybe you can argue for different things like how are these controls going to affect business practice and onboarding new developers? So this is a, these are the kind of things and the kind of issues, especially the CISO role where you may be either reporting directly to the CEO or reporting to the chief information officer. At that level, you're thinking about business as well as security. So you need to be able to speak that language to talk to those people and try to argue and communicate in that way. Questions? I'll read the description later. This is like high level. Cool, and just text. So I don't want any PDFs, docx, other file types, just an ASCII text file with words. Super simple. <coughs> Questions on that? Super straightforward. How many words? It needs to be a thorough description. <laughs> so that's why I don't want to put on a limit because some of you will just spew garbage until you think you've hit the limit, and some of you will. Um, I don't know, take it as a challenge, and I feel like it's counterproductive. So you should feel like you comprehensively, like that the CEO of this company, the founder of this company looks at this and says, yes, I agree with this, we need to implement this plan. So thorough is the name of the game. All right, part three, I think it's kind of fun. Um, part three is to critique the ASU's computer use policy. So ASU has a computer use policy, it's defined in the academic handbook as 123, or 125, sorry. Uh, the Computer, Internet, and Electronic Communications Information Management Policy. So the idea here is you're going to read this policy, write an analysis of it, what you think about this policy, what threats you think that it effectively combats, what threats you think it does not combat, and the core here is to include one change that you would make to this policy and include both technical and a business justification for this change. And I can't promise this, so maybe I should take this off this video, but if there's something really, really cool or interesting, I do know Tina Thorsten, Thorsten? I just realized I don't know her last name, but Tina is the CISO of ASU, so if you have really good ideas, I can run them by her to see what she thinks. <laughs> so simple, simple writing, name, ASU ID, 
Part four is where we get into coding, because I do want this to not just be a writing course. It should be um, a coding course as well. So we'll kind of do a mix throughout the semester. So every assignment will have components of each. You're going to write a, you're going to implement a, pro, you're going to write a program that implements a policy for securing a house. So there's a description, a text description of the policy. The interface, you will create an executable file. Um, you can write the program in any programming language you want. I don't really care. Um, there's instructions on there about how to configure this. As long as you create a make file that when we run make on your program in your source code directory outputs an executable secure underscore house, it doesn't matter what language you're writing this in. So choose your favorite language, choose a new language, I don't really care. Um, so the input is the owner's name of the house and the different keys involved in the house. And I'm going to go deliberately at a high level on this because part of this is you reading and trying to understand the policy from the language here. And so the inputs will be a series of new line separated inputs of all the events that are happening to the house. So these are all of the possible events. Um, some of the, inserting a key, entering the house, asking who's inside, changing the locks, and leaving the house. And each of these specifies what your response should be in these cases according to the policy. So you can think of it, and there's an example here where you can say that you're running a secure house, here's the input, and you'll be reading on standard input, outputting a standard output. Has to work on Ubuntu 1604, 64 bit. So that's going to be our platform for the rest of the course, all of the stuff. So uh, if you need, you may need to set up a virtual machine for this. There's lots of instructions out there. Please use the course mailing list. There's a lot of people who are good at this stuff in this class. So if you have problems, definitely ask. I don't think, and, I, and you'll also be able to, so um, I'll put up, so part of this is there's not quite a submission site yet to submit your things because I realized that 1404 was entering its end of life phase, so I should move everything over to 1604, and of course that doesn't just work, so I have to upgrade my submission server to 1604. So, uh, by Monday, by Monday I'll have the submission server, I'll post it out uh, on the mailing list, I'll also include the link here. And it'll be very clear about how to you'll create it. The, the site with your ASU ID is pretty, pretty simple. Um, and so you can submit a packages file with the packages that you need if you're using something non-standard. So the example here is if you want to code in Haskell, the Haskell compiler is not included by default, so you can add a packages file with the packages you want installed. And when we run and test your code, it will tell you, uh, it will actually install these, so you'll have those available to you. Are those apt packages or? Yes, AP, only APT standard packages. <coughs> Cool. Questions? Yeah. So as in past semesters, the submission server will run unit tests against the code and tell us our completion percentage? Yes. You'll know right away your, your score. It'll tell you exactly your score. And then you'll also submit the other assignments on the submission server. So they'll be a form to submit those. Um, so just please submit them there. I don't know if those all. I'll probably limit it to something like 20 submissions or something, and you'll know the limit just so that that way uh, you don't just spam it trying to fix things. Yeah. <coughs> one attempt for one submission? No, 20, let's say 20 submissions for now. We'll see if how that goes. <coughs> Maybe like 30. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> Somebody in 341's got up to like 80 or 90 and ended up I think crashing the server because there was like an n squared operation over the number of submissions and so it just ground to a halt. Yeah. Do we know when the program ends? Like it shows keywords that end the program? When standard input ends. So when, when standard when you don't have any more standard input, then you're done. You just quit. So it could be run just interactive. It's kind of I was going for like a mud type interface. Um, it can also be a file typed in standard input, all that stuff. So cool. Fun. Fun. What's a mud? <laughs> you want to explain what a mud is? I actually don't remember what it stands for. A multi user dungeon? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so and people still don't know what that means. So that's like the precursor to WoW and like MMOs 
used to be completely text-based, like, oh, be one of those, yes, like, you're in a forest, what direction do you want to go? You go up, to, or north, south, east, west, and I don't know, it's completely text-based interface. Look up MUDs, they're, they're interesting, and a good part of computing culture. Cool, any more questions? Start off on, did we leave on access control list or create capability list? I think we did that. Okay. Cool. So we talked about on Tuesday, how do we actually try to implement this access control matrix? Because it seems very unwieldy. As we get more and more objects, more and more subjects in our system, we're not going to be able to actually say and, and deal with all of these, this huge matrix, this million by million row matrix. So we actually talked about one way of how to store this matrix, of how to actually implement this matrix would be to store metadata with each object that specified the rights that the subjects had to this object. Right? So in this, in our case, so you can think of it as column-based in the terms of the, the matrix, right? So every column for file F would have um, file F would have some metadata that says P. Uh, process P has read, write, and ownership access, and process Q has append access. And whereas uh, file G would have process P has read access, and process Q has read and ownership access. And so these are stored with the files. So what are, what are some of the benefits of this type of an approach? file or database in the operating system. So you can think of it as kind of a distributed problem where now you've distributed the access, the uh, matrix to each object, right? That's one aspect. What happens if something, is, what if happens if process X tries to read file F? What should happen?
the row, right? So what are the files and what are the rights over all of the objects and subjects in the system that this specific subject has? So in this case, the case here we have P, process P would have, so we call this capability list, some type of, some type of capability. So here, process P over, has the capabilities over file F, read, write, own, and over file G, R. And same thing with Q, so we can, <coughs> we change that, that's no, always good. P and Q, okay, getting my G's and Q's messed up. So what's the benefit here? to change, let's say, P and take away the subject's right to ever touch file F or even all the files. Let's say we wanted to change subject P and say, okay, subject P should never be able to read any file in our system anymore. We can easily update, get P's capabilities and remove and revoke those rights from P. How do we actually, how would we implement this? Where would this capability list live? Before we said we when we were talking access control list, we said the access control list would be metadata essentially stored with the file that the operating system would manage. So what about in this case? How would we actually implement this? Can we use that approach? Can we store in the processes memory their capabilities? So it'd be all inside the user subfolder? I mean, it's one way of going about it. It's saying these users have access to this stuff. Anything outside of that is not accessible. Yeah. Is this kind of the purpose of the Windows NT system registry <coughs> with all the freaky registry keys? Is this where this happens? Is this where this happens or happens? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, actually, that, that was my idea to store the registry. <coughs> But then who edits those, those registry keys? The kernel. <coughs> the kernel. So one way would be store it essentially in the kernel. Right? Why would you not want to just store it in the process itself? Because then it's kind of like a data process without the way that it would have all access. Yeah, you may be able to. So one thing would be, so some of the things we want from a capability list is we want it to be the case that A, P or Q should not be able to alter their capability lists, right? So this is, we need some kind of protection mechanism there such that they can't just alter it. So you just say, hey, I'll just store it. It'll be always at address 1000 in the process memory space. Well, the process owns and has read write access to all of their memory. So they could go and change that and tamper with it and try to do interesting things to that. And then maybe a new process could just create memory that says, yes, they have access like all of the capabilities, right? So who do we want to be able to control the storage of capabilities and the ish issuing of capabilities? The user? Super user, root.
preservation policy, right, specifies what people should be allowed to do. If anybody can arbitrarily create any type of capabilities, then what's the point of having the capabilities in the first place? So this is kind of part of the core tenet here is depend, you know, it does get a little bit technical on how you implement it, but fundamentally, people should not just be able to arbitrarily create new capabilities, right? The system itself, you need to have some trusted entity that is trusted to manage these capabilities and issue capabilities. <coughs> So let's say these are encrypted, opaque files, right? So let's say the capability of some file, so like the, you request the system, hey, I want my capabilities, they say, great, your process key, here's your capability list, right? So then to access file F, you call open to the operating system and you say, here's my capability, here's my file, right? So the operating system will get that, it'll check the file, and then give you access to F. So is that a good solution? So now who's, who's, so let's think about this. Who's responsible for managing their capabilities and storing them? In this, it's the subjects responsible for it, right? Correct, yeah, in this example. So the subjects, so if the, if, a capability is like a file, then the subject, so P would be responsible for storing it, which could be nice from the operating system's perspective because then it doesn't have to store it, and so you're kind of pushing that problem onto the users, which is kind of nice. Like the less that the kernel has to do, the better. What are some drawbacks of that approach? Well, it just seems that, I mean, that's like, you wouldn't want, a, it, that doesn't seem to be enforcing uh, secure by default, right? Like, you're, if you're demanding that the person trying to get into your house is responsible for the maintenance of their key, like, there, it just seems like it'd be easier for the subject to be able to manipulate his... Because what could they do in that example? So, like, the key example with the house. So, essentially, you can think of the capabilities as some kind of key or token that describes your rights within the system. So, what, go back to our key example, what kind of threats apply here? They could... If the process, if the subject's in charge of its own access matrix, like why can't it just give itself permissions? Like who's? So let's say it's it's completely opaque. The process can't modify the file at all. So they can't change their capabilities. The OS will be able to detect that. They can give it to somebody else. They can give them to somebody else, just like a key, right? So process P may be able to give their capabilities to process Q, and now Q has the union of both capabilities which according to our access control policy is not what we wanted to have happen because we set specific rights on these files. So it's why like capabilities can be a little tricky. Um, you, you don't necessarily want, you, there's usually a layer of indirection, so you don't necessarily want users to be able to have these and store these because they come with all the same key problems. Uh, we'll get into this a little bit more in a second, but it's important to think about. So the other way to think about this is a relational uh, list, which are, which are not lists, but essentially, basically for every single right, for every single subject, uh, right, and object, there's an entry in a table that specifies their access. Anybody do any database work, work with databases? Some? How do you get, what, how are permissions done in the database, like let's say MySQL? Do all users in MySQL, so does MySQL have users? <coughs> yes, what do they, do they have access to everything? Why, why do they even have users? So you can give them access to everything. So you, that's the only way you've ever used it, is giving the user access to everything. <laughs> web development thing now. But you don't have to do that. And it may make more sense to try to architect your application with different users who have different rights in the system. So that way, even if somebody, let's say, you have an admin user and a regular user, that way if there's a SQL injection on the regular user, they can't have <coughs> access to your entire database and do everything. They're restricted in what they do. Uh, but that is a huge web application problem. Um, 
But in general, so anybody, I mean, how do you, so how do you, do anybody know the query of how to grant permissions on MySQL? Yeah, it's a SQL query. It's, I actually can't remember it. That's why I asked. Um, it's a trick. So it's like grant whatever permissions on whatever database and tables. Yeah, or the privileges. Yeah, so you can grant, what is it, read, write, um, <coughs> the ability to grant other people privileges to, that, uh, to those tables. And so this is pretty much how, exactly how it's done. So you, it actually makes sense. SQL, itself uses a, uses a database table to implement uh, their, to store their access control policy. So by, at the first stage, I believe the, only the root user can access this table and add new entries by issuing these commands. Then you could have people say they can grant permissions, but only on this specific table. So you can change and alter their permissions, but they're all stored in a database table like this. So this would be kind of the other way to think about this is in a relational style. Okay, cool. So we've been kind of talking about this, but I want to bring us uh, kind of home to some points here about access control list versus capabilities. So do you agree with this statement? Uh, access control list requires the authentication of subjects Why is it true? So what was authentication? Sorry, just please. Yeah. Are you saying that access control list, like a prerequisite for using an access access control list, is that you have authenticated subjects? Correct. Okay, I agree with that. <laughs> So what do we know? So when we say we're trying to access file Q, we know exactly what object it is that we're trying to access, right? So the system, the kernel, knows the object F is being accessed. So there had better be a, a way for the kernel to authenticate that yes, the person making this call is actually process P, right? And if you don't have this, then your whole scheme falls apart. Is the same thing true for uh, for capability lists? So, is it true all the time? So, what's the difference here? Is there any difference? Do you still need strong authentication? And with the capability list, like you said, you could have somebody giving their key over. Like if P gave Q his key, then Q could just use it. They didn't have to authenticate that they were in fact P. Correct, so yeah, it actually kind of depends on how we want to go with it. So yes, in that case, so for P to get its capabilities in the first place, does it need to authenticate itself to the system? In general, 
you don't actually have to re-authenticate the subjects because you know, just like a key, right? The own, whoever owns this key gets access. Um, the problem comes in, as we talked about, is what happens with propagation of keys, right? So in the physical world, this is a huge problem. So how are key propagations regulated? Physical keys. Yeah. The key has stamps on it. Do not copy. Please. 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 Exactly. Yeah. So what's that for? Post office box. Well, not in the What's the purpose, sorry, of uh, writing that down? Yeah. Um, the key um, is supposed to keep key make you know people who make keys from copying that key, but that doesn't really work because all you have to do is sign a little thing that says I'm authorized to copy this key anyway, and they make a key for you. That's good. Let me look at my keys. Done that quite a few times. <laughs> So it says restricted, do not duplicate. And yeah, they just take your other ID. side though, it says state of Arizona. So I don't know if I'm maybe, sure it depends on what the level yeah, exactly. of security is, but I, I think some of them I don't have any other ones, but some I remember would have the phone number of a person. Sure. So the idea was that whoever's making a copy of that key would then call that number to verify that yes, this person should be making a copy of this key. But does it completely restrict the propagation of keys? No, why not? Why not? 3D printers, you can 3D print a key, as we talked about from a picture. You can make a old school mold, you can um, push it into a bar of soap to get the shape of the key, right? Um, so yeah, there's other ways, other avenues to make keys besides going to a store to do it. So, yeah. I thought you said lost my mind at first. <laughs> oh God, what have I been talking about? <laughs> All right. Okay, keep talking, somebody. Describe me a little locksmith. Little locksmith? Describe me a little locksmith. Use reputable, wait. It's what? reputable. Ah, 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 I see, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that would be kind of the way around that, right? Would be to use a locksmith that is not unscrupulous. Right. Uh, just get your own key making machine. Or you can buy your own key making machine. There we go. All right, that one's charging. <laughs> Hello. Okay, cool. So in the physical world, controlling prop pop, uh, controlling propagation is difficult. So, and this even still applies with um, so even when we move into more digital physical things like our access ID cards, I'm not going to show you guys anything, I don't know what's on here that you could copy, right? But to get Isaac access, right, you use these and you can badge in. So it's better than a key in some sense because you can have fine-grained control over who can access what and during what times. But at the same time, you can always give somebody else your ASU ID and they could badge in, right? Um, this is why, so at secure, uh, more secure facilities, I actually had, when I was working at at t Government Solutions, I wasn't, I was working there as an intern and I hadn't been in for a long time and I went in and uh, I had my badge on, I must have had my badge, you like, have to wear your badge and then somebody else saw me, didn't recognize me and so questioned that I was actually an employee there and then took me to my boss so my boss could prove that I actually was an employee there, uh, which was weird. Um, but in like secure, and that, that facility wasn't secure, but they did have another secure facility um, in that same building, so it's kind of the same philosophy there. So this kind of brings us back to capability. So we can actually not require authentication of our subjects if we can control the propagation of capabilities. And if people can't fabricate capabilities out of thin air, right? So in this sense, so if we can guarantee that the capabilities are unforgeable, right, which means that no, there are no 3D printing machines that can make capabilities for my systems, and that we 
control the fact that users or subjects in our systems can propagate those capabilities to other, um, to other <coughs> things. So which is better between these two? So maybe you can combine them. Yeah, like it's not necessarily an either or choice. Um, but going back to the, the theory, so are, is there hard things that one can do that the other cannot? And how would you prove that? Seems to, I mean, it just seems to me that the, on the per object basis, just a, a, like the ability to manipulate that object and make big changes to that seems easier. Like with, you could say, the like file A, if you were just like, I want to make sure everyone can read it, that'd just be seemingly easier to do because you're just changing file A. But, uh, but the per subject base would just be a lot easier if you just wanted to completely give or revoke rights to a user to every to every file. That'd be easier on the per subject basis. But like, <coughs> I guess it just depends on what do you want. To, what are you more manipulating, the user or the file? What what? And in that sense, I guess what gets changed the most? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, and you had a hand up. Um, I was going to say something similar. Just that the complexity of. You know, in an, in an ACL, the complexity of adding a new user 
goes up a lot as you have more files. Mm. Whereas the opposite is true for capability, right? Because if you if you add a new user who are using ACL and you have like a million files, it takes forever. But if you're adding a new file, when you have a bunch of users in a capability scenario, then you have to touch every single user's capabilities. Right, and so you have to solve that problem of how do you actually do the users then request their new capabilities? Do you notify them that they have new capabilities? How do you deal with that? Yeah. Could you solve that issue by kind of doing how like Linux and Unix kind of manage your systems where you can actually give like group permissions for files? Like if a user sitting in a certain group, they can do these right <coughs> permissions? Uh, in some sense, yes. Yeah. So we'll, we'll talk about that in general. But uh, yeah, if you wanted to add a new user to the system and you wanted that specific user to have rights to all the files, you'd have to go change every single file in the system in the per object basis. But in the subject basis, it's super easy. You just issue them a credential that, hey, they have access to all the files, or the capability that they have access to all the files. Um, so yeah, we'll get to Unix, uh, the Linux Unix system in a second. What about fundamentally? Can you express or do something on the per object basis that you can't do on a per subject basis? Probably not. Probably not, why? So these are some other things to think about. So we talk about least privilege, so giving something the least amount of privileges able to do its job. And this is actually, I think we just touched on just earlier, is that with capabilities, you can give a subject, let's say that it's a lot easier to create a subject to just do some things to some files, and then it goes away. So you don't actually have to go change every single file that you know that that subject's going to touch. Um, so this just goes back to what we were talking about there. So access review, so we want to audit our access control policy and say, okay, we know we designed it with this policy in mind, but what state is the system actually in? So if you have these two different models, if you're trying to say what's the current state of the access control of the system, how would you do that in terms of access control list versus capabilities? You're an admin, you now want to review the access control that's actually implemented and say, okay, who can do what? Although there's, there's less of them. 
Definitely. So it kind of depends on what our goal is, right? If we want to look at, so if we want to ask the question kind of for all files on a computer, who can access what file? And if we want to ask the question of all the process processes that are running on, a, on the machine, at this point in time, what files can they touch and what rights do they have on those files? Uh, so it depends on kind of our perspective there, yeah. say that we say this user has or whatever it is has access to these file types and then just like abstract general generalization? Yes, we haven't touched on that, but yes, you could define your rights in terms where you could say, for instance, they can touch any file in this directory, right, which could be a wide range of files. Um, and I kind of, on the ACL, I kind of, my intuition would be like, if you're going to have to query it for every file, I'd be a pretty massive file that keeps because it would, it would increase with all the users, right? So every file would have some variable size associated with it. So if you had like a system file that was needed to be read by every single user on the system, that access control list would be huge because it would increase with all of the users on the system. Um, yeah, so uh, basically exactly what we talked about, right? So the idea is if you want to do object-focused things, then access control lists are much better. If you want to do subject focused things, then capability lists are much better. And revocation, so we talk about this too, right? So what does revocation mean? Removing the rights. We want to remove rights. When do we want to do that? Termination. What was that? Termination. Termination, yeah, so maybe we terminate an employee, right? They no longer work for us. Um, maybe an employee gets, rather than terminated, they, let's say, were a system admin, but now they move to a development role or they move to some other role in the company, they still should not have you know, super user root access to all the systems. They should have what developers have, right? So you want to re revoke their rights. So, so for ACL, I think it's pretty clear that um, if we want to revoke the rights of our subjects to a specific file or a specific object, ACL lists are clearly much better. Right. In terms of protecting your home directory, it's a lot easier to be able to just change the permissions of your directory to say nobody can read or write to my home directory, rather than try to, so then how would we revoke in the capability system? Because all you need is this thing that says I have this thing, so how would you do that? Can you revoke? I, we didn't really talk about it. We talked about non-propagation. You have to create a new like key that would say that this is the type of key you have to use from now on, and then like the old ones get like pushed away. Or what, what's the word when you depreciate it? I guess. Yes. Yeah, so, but how would you actually do that? You have to have some kind of mechanism that tests which type like the which type of key it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's interesting. So you can have a for every let's say subject, you could have like a key version number yeah. stored in some central location, and then when you want to revoke it. You increment the version number so you know if they try to access a resource with this capability, you'll check that capability version number is five, but you know they have version number six, and so then you could uh, would say, hey, sorry, not that your access is denied, but you need to reacquire your capabilities. Um, yeah, that does have you one way to do it else. Yeah. Um, maybe you can create keys that last only a certain amount of time. Yeah, so we could put a timestamp on our key we could specify that our system will only accept keys that are valid for a configurable amount of time. Because maybe we want 30 seconds, maybe a minute, maybe a day is fine with us in our organization. Because we're say, you know, it's okay if they can use the key for a day. We're not really worried about that. We have audit systems in place, and that would require people to re-authenticate and re-get keys um, every day. But that's fine. Maybe not every minute would be too much. <laughs> Cool. So it's definitely doable, and it is done in many different ways, some of which are the ones we talked about, which is cool. Yeah, so we kind of talked about this. So we, we have a case where we want, so we saw access control list is pretty simple, right? If I own a file, that means I can modify its access control list. So if I'm process P, I want to grant process Q read access to file F. Assuming, of course, I own file F, then in an access control list, this is easy. The operating system modifies the 
uh, thing, the the access what am I thinking? The access control list of the file to say that process Q can now read that file. And then when process Q tries to access it, uh, the system knows that it's process Q, and so it knows that it can do that. So, be, so that's an access control. What about the capabilities? So is this revocation necessarily? It's actually kind of the opposite in some sense, right? Because we're trying to give somebody additional permissions, not take away their permissions. So how would you do this? What are some possibilities? So we have a situation like this. P's like this, Q's like this. Allowed you to hopefully grant those privileges, mm -hmm. right? So, yes. so, uh, so yeah. So file app is definitely owned by process P. So process P can do this according to our policy. And then uh, you have to have some sort of uh, in the it ability, like instructions, to to allow that. That would check. Well, first, you just have to check if P had. The, the ability which it does, and then mm -hmm. be, it would be able to grant that to who? You. Well, who would be able to grant that? Well, I guess you? I would imagine. I, would, I mean, I imagine only the, the the kernel is. So I guess P would petition Q. The kernel would check if P had the ownership. Mm -hmm. Since P does, P would tell the kernel give this, essentially change Q's to add it, and then. Uh, yeah, so we could use two models, right? We can kind of do this model where we talked about where basically Q has to essentially re-establish its new capabilities. So P could tell the system, hey, I want to, you know, I own this file, I want to grant Q access, and so Q could then, uh, so the operating system would be, okay, good, and then Q would either have to somehow, a P would have to tell Q, hey, I made this change, you have re-access, re-get your capabilities. So either the system knows to do this, based on our kind of revocation, versioning scheme, or, and so it just gets a whole kind of new permissions, or it can either just get some kind of an additional permission, so it doesn't have to be always, um, you can actually kind of think about segmenting these, these capabilities out so that uh, rather than reacquire all of their capabilities, uh, Q could just say, hey, I should have read access to this file, can you give me that capability, and it will give that there. So yeah, definitely good ways to do that. Okay, cool, I wanna make sure we get this. Definitely this came up. So Unix access control list. This should be something that you're very familiar with because you've been developing stuff for Linux systems. You have access to a shared server. So Linux access, so how many bits do that? So how many, okay, let's step back for a second. So we talked about it a little bit earlier. In general, how, what does, how does the Unix access control list work? You don't have to talk about everything, you can just talk about one thing. Owner group global? Owner group. Is that what it is or something? Other. No. Other? Other is, is the O. So rather than for every, so on a specific file, right, rad, so on an object, you can't specify arbitrary users have arbitrary permissions to this file. You can only say, so what's the owner? I guess maybe it's um, an additional piece of information that we haven't talked about yet. So on Unix, every file has a user who owns the file, so that would be the owner privilege, and a group that owns the file. So that's when you do ls-l, that's those two usernames next to the file. So what these permissions mean is, so what permissions do the, what rights does the owner of the file have? What rights does the group owner of the file have, the group that owns the file have? and what permissions does everyone else on the system have. And so 
this way, rather than say it's an arbitrary number of bits or bytes that we have to spend for every single file on the system, and the more files, the file that's read or used by the most people would have the most size, right? That does not seem like a very scalable solution. They restricted the types of access control policies that you can create in some sense and made some things difficult, but now you're limiting, so you only use 12 bits on each file to specify the permissions. And so we think about them in terms of three, three bit, four sets of three bits. There we go. So anybody know off the top of their head what the first three bits are? I guess it would help if they were filled out. So we talked about before that in the etc password file, so if we look, and can everybody see the screen or should I make the font bigger? People in the back? Bigger? Bigger. It's cool, don't worry. Um, okay, so we can see that the permissions on etc password so we know it's owned by root, and it's group root owns this file. So that's what these two are here. And so these are our 12 bits. Uh, well, OK, not really. These are our, we'll look at it in a second. They, they merge the three highest bits into other bits in the system. So, um, so that, that, that was my confusion, because yes. the use is mod is yes. 777, so it's yes. three groups of four, not so is it a rearrangement of what you were talking about before? Because each, each hex character is four bits. And so we have one, one uh, when we have chmod, the first one is for owner, the second one is for group, and then the third is for everybody else. 
Yes, I think you're correct. Correct. I think I was. Uh, I'm thinking more in logical bits. I have to revisit whether it's exactly that overlap there. Or order to three. Exactly. Okay, so we know. Yeah, I think I believe this last bit represents the. No, no, no. Okay, so let's go back. So it's. Um, this last bit represents the first three bits. So this will change depending on what the rest of it is, I believe. And so this is read, write, execute of the owner. So those are three bits. This is read, write, execute of the group and read, write, execute of other. Um, cool. Okay, so we can see that it's, so who can write to this file based on the permissions here? The owner. The owner, which is who? Root. So on here, when we look at this file, remember we mentioned that it has the username, it used to have the password, which is why it used to be called passwd. Um, it does not anymore, we'll go into that later. It has the user ID, so this is how you actually associate the name to the user ID in the system. So in the file, it's not storing that root is the owner, it's saying file ID zero, or user ID zero is the owner. Um, the home directory is, uh, these are, I believe, the group. And this is the home directory of the user. So this gets set, the environment variable home gets set to this value. And finally, here is the shell. So should users be able to change their own shell if they want to use? Yes. Yeah, that would be a nice thing to do, right? You as a user should be able to say, I don't want to use whatever this is, uh, bin bash, I want to use bin sh or bin something else. The question is how to do that. So do you give the entire system right access to this file? Why not? What happened, what would happen if anyone on the system could write to this file? Anybody could add users, could change anybody else's shell. Should I be able to change your shells? No, definitely not, right? So we need this restricted access here, but the access control system that we have here is so coarse grained that we can't actually specify that users should be able to change just the, this value in this file. So the way Unix gets around this, there is a uh, So there's uh, chsh is the program to change the shell. Now, oh, I guess I lied. I, I need to look at what this bit is. So the first bit, oh yeah, your question? That bit to what I've seen usually denotes if it's a directory or not. Okay, then that's, uh, let's test that here. No, no. Yep, yeah. you're right. And a link. <laughs> and maybe a link. link. All right, cool. Yeah, we'll show sim link too, but... All right, I'll figure that out. I'll clarify that for Tuesday. Um, but for here, so we can see here now there's a different thing on this bit, which is the S bit, which is um, S instead of an X here. So what this means is that the file is executable and that highest bit, the sticky bit, is set. And what the sticky bit means is that when we execute user bin chsh, rather than this being run as, let's see if I can show this. Um, I don't think there's anything installed in here. Um, okay, so why I do this? Um, so, CHH, CH, C, CH8, uh, change shell, the program, <laughs> will change the shell of the user. So in order, which means it needs to be able to write to that etc password file, but it can't run with our permissions because if it ran as our permissions as a user, then we could just alter, we would not be able to alter the file, right? The file would try to read from the um, etc password file and the system would say, go away, you're, you're, you're not a valid user. So what this sticky bit, the set, or, sticky, set UID bit, it's too many bits, the set UID bit says that whoever executes this file will execute, the process will run as the owner of this file. So that's what the set UID bit, the S on the owner execute 
means this file is executable. And when you execute this file, it, it runs as the user. So it runs as root. So this is why CH, uh, change shell is able to change the etc password file, even though you are running it as a user. And this would ever finish, I could actually show you that in action. So set group ID, this is the same thing as the set user ID, the set UID. So set group ID is the same thing, but with the group. So when you execute that program, it executes with the permissions of the group and of who owns the file, not the person who executes the file. So similar thing here. All right, let's see if this works. There we go. change to nobody. Uh, okay, so I'm now running as nobody. So if I type in cat, let me go to this other terminal, we can see that cat is now running as nobody. Everybody agree? Actually, have any other users on a system? This is the problem. Um, but is there a way? Anybody see a user? Maybe sync. Yeah, but root will run as root. It doesn't demonstrate <laughs> the point I'm trying to make. Super secure password name password. <laughs> okay. Okay, now I'm running as the Adam user. I should be able to run. So let's just verify again for purposes. Yes, Adam is running. Um, and then we can kill this. Run. And then we can see that CHSH is running as root because it's that UID, uh, has the set UID bit set. At this and we'll get into what sticky bit and all the other permissions are. Well, what do you, uh, gentlemen, got going? 